The following is distributed by the Berean Call. You're listening to Search the Scriptures Daily, a program in which we encourage everyone who desires to know God's truth to look to God's Word for all that is essential for salvation and living one's life in a way that is pleasing to Him. Our topic for this segment of our program is Dave Hunt's book, Yoga and the Body of Christ, What Position Should Christians Hold? And we're concerned about yoga's popularity within Christianity, not only because it's a religion that is in direct opposition to biblical Christianity, but its growing acceptance by many Christians indicates there is a critical lack of discernment in the evangelical church today. So no matter where you stand on the issue, hopefully we can provide information about the subject that you'll find helpful. Dave, why would it be necessary, and obviously some thought it to be very necessary, to create a, quote, spiritual emergency network, end of quote, with centers around the country complete with hotlines and lists of licensed mental health professionals who are on call? Tom, uh, this was started mainly by Christina Groff, and along with her husband, Stanislav. And um, there were so many people who were experiencing spiritual emergencies. They were, as the hippies used to say, freaking out. They were having uh, demonic experiences, to mm -hmm. put it bluntly. Uh, they were, um, wow, seeing demons. They were... Uh, on the verge of insanity, uh, and having horrible, horrible experiences as a result of practicing yoga. Not just from drugs, of course, you expect that from drugs, but um, from Eastern meditation. We talked about it in some prior programs, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, TM, Transcendental Meditation. Uh, so many of the practitioners of that, some of them went insane or ended up in insane asylums. Some of them uh, committed suicide. Uh, you remember the young lady we uh, interviewed at one time? And suddenly there's a demon on each side of her trying to get in as she's practicing TM. So the Groffs started this, and they eventually... Uh, had a network. Yeah. Dave, let me give you uh, some information from their promotional material. It says, trained graduate students in the School of Professional Psychology at the California Institute for Integral Studies respond to each caller, providing assistance and educational information regarding spiritual emergence. They can also make referrals to licensed mental health professionals in the caller's area goes on to say uh, the advisors are respectful of spiritual experience, familiar with a number of spiritual traditions, and qualified to work with various areas of difficulty. Now, Tom, you, the term that they use is spiritual emergence. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about spiritual emergency. So they are trying to say, well, this is all good. You see, you are emerging Mm -hmm. into a higher level of spirituality. And, of course, you're going to have nightmares and you're going to have visions and mm -hmm. demonic appearances. Well, that's just part of this process. Uh, so they're not really uh, going to discourage you. It says, they, oh, they're familiar with all of these traditions. They're not going to say anything is right or anything is wrong, but they're just trying to nurse you through, you know. Uh, and um, that's so tragic. But uh, this is demonic stuff. Now, the reason for it is we've got Satan himself, the serpent, involved, and he plays a huge part in yoga. Oh, well, Dave, that brings us to uh, the title for Chapter 6 of your book. You title it, The Great Dragon, That Old Serpent. And... Uh, you know, but, but before I, I get to that, I'm sure there are people out there think, man, I never heard of any of this stuff. You know, I thought yoga was just, 
you know, I was just going to the the YMCA to mm. to do some stretching exercises, or to the local Baptist church. Well, now that's the situation. Yeah. Not just Baptist, Presbyterian, right. Methodist, and so on. They don't have to go to the YMCA anymore. It's it's right there, and as we've seen and we've talked about. Uh, these programs are growing in popularity. You have more people showing up in, in, in some churches for yoga exercises than they do for Bible studies, that kind of stuff. That's what concerns us. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom, uh, we've talked about in the past. We know where yoga comes from. It is pure Hinduism. Mm-hmm. It was devised because they're trying to escape time, sense, and the elements and reach moksha, uh, it's called, uh, Buddhists call it nirvana. They're trying to get beyond uh, this physical body and this physical world. Uh, in fact, it is not uh, anything that was developed to improve anyone's health or physical fitness. It is, in fact, a technique for dying technique for getting out of this body uh, into the next reincarnation, mm-hmm. or depending upon what they may believe in. Uh, so, uh, Tom, um, people are being deceived, and now somebody can say, well, I've been practicing yoga for 10 years, and it didn't bother me. I didn't have any of this. Well, okay, but uh, many, many people do have mm-hmm. problems. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, uh, who knows what spiritual delusions this person has embraced through yoga. Yeah. David, I just want to comment about uh, the, what you said about yoga is not for health. Uh, we you know, just had a conference, as you know, and uh, Carol Matriciana was here. Uh, she's the producer of, uh, of a video that we offer on yoga, which is really terrific. But she grew up in India. And one of the things in talking to her, one of the things that she said, uh, I mean, logically, based on what we've been saying, I, I should have thought of this. But she said, you know, Tom, growing up in India, and <clears throat> obviously yoga, being Hinduism, mm-hmm. it was a part of life there, but it was never a part of life for young people. It was always for older people who, you know, because it had to do with death and dying, not right, for right. developing physical health. Right. And yet that's what it's being promoted as right. in the United States. And, and even in India today, I mean, which is interesting. So the, the, the real theology behind it is being um, really overturned. But getting on to chapter chapter six, the which you titled "The Great Dragon, That Old Serpent." That old serpent, the devil. This is Revelation chapter twelve, mm-hmm. who deceives the whole world, and uh, it's interesting that Satan, he kind of likes to be called the serpent. You'd think he would try to avoid that, mm-hmm. but instead, he is worshipped in the form of a serpent all over this world and that's kind of what we get into in this chapter. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to uh, just underscore some of these things, the religions of the world and how they've taken uh, the lie uh, of the serpent to Eve and turned it into uh, a blessing. In other words, Satan is worshipped not because people are into satanic worship but because in in the historical process of him of the lie and the deceit involved mm-hmm. now this has become a good thing so but dave there's a couple of things i'd like you to address in this number one it really demonstrates that this was a historical event why would these people in all of these religions from south america to the uh, i mean all over the world the greek the roman gods to the norse gods and so on there's a serpent involved in some way. What? Did somebody just come up with that? Uh, these, in, these cultures, independent of one another, all have the same idea? Well, Tom, I was um, speaking about this, I forget when, at a church, and a man came up to me afterwards, and, uh, or he may have raised his hand in the Q&A and said it publicly. I don't remember. 
But he said he had just come back from northern India and way off in the jungles where nobody gets. And uh, they visited this temple, ancient temple, and inside uh, there was, I don't know, you couldn't call it a fresco. It was a painting of some kind or other, really mm -hmm. an ancient painting, very dim now with time. Uh, and uh, it was of a, there was a serpent, a woman, and a tree. Maybe I had mentioned that uh, archaeologists digging all over the world, they come across these three together, serpent, a woman, and a tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he asked the natives there through an interpreter, why, why this? And they said, well, we worship the serpent. And he asked, well, why do you worship the serpent? Well, the serpent is the creator. Uh, he's our savior. Uh, he brings the blessings to us. So you have the uh, Genesis story turned inside out. Right. And now the serpent is no longer the destroyer. He's not the, uh, the one who lies to the human race, but he's the savior. Now, Tom, uh, just from my poor memory, because I haven't even thought about this for many years, but you can go right down the list. Let's start with voodoo, with regard to the serpent. Uh, they teach that the great serpent is the fountain of all true wisdom and the creator of the universe who took the rainbow as his wife and from the union came blood and all creatures. I'm quoting Dave. Uh, and then, as a final gift, they taught the people to partake of the blood as a sacrament that they might become the spirit and embrace the wisdom of the serpent, end of quote. Well, that's part of it, Tom. You've got the Hopi Indian dance. Right. Well, um, you've got, uh, I mean, well, I was going to go back. Let's go back a little farther. Sure. Let's go back to the Orphic egg, a symbol of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Wrapped around it is a serpent showing that he really is the originator, the sustainer, and so forth. Um, or if you went to the temples uh, in Egypt, Serapis, the, the god, has a serpent coiled on his forehead. Mm -hmm. Or you could go to Central South America, Quetzalcoatl, mm -hmm. the um, plumed serpent of the Mayans, mm -hmm. the Aztecs. Again, the savior so of the forth. world from their right. perspective. Uh, it's staggering. You got the Naga of, of the Scandinavians. Right. Or you, and in... Asculapius. Right. Uh, you've got, um, well, the Caduceus, the symbol. You see it on license plates on cars. The symbol of modern medicine uh, is um, a staff with a serpent wound around it. And that comes from the temples of Aesculapius, the god Aesculapius. And the god Aesculapius was worshipped with serpents. Why was that? I mean, this is into modern medicine now. Because of an ancient story that said the god Aesculapius had received a healing herb from the mouth of a serpent. Uh, so the serpent, again, is not the destroyer. He's not the liar. He's the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. And how does he save us but through drugs, you know, the, the healing herb. Uh, and uh, so I, I remember, Tom, being at a, uh, it was a graduation. This happened to be USC, I think, University of Southern California. Uh, and the graduates were receiving their MD degree. And uh, they all recited together the Hippocratic Oath. It sort of, sort of begins like this. Oh, if you can do it, go ahead. Yeah, I think I can. Mm -hmm. um, it, be, it begins something like this. I swear by Aesculapius Physician, and by Apollo, by Hygieia, by Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses. Now, where did I miss it, Tom? 
Well, you just turn a few things around, but then it says making them my witnesses. Right. You Thank think you. that would shock some people out there to know <laughs> this is what this is what's been going on for? This is the Hippocratic oath yeah. mm -hmm. that is still current among doctors mm -hmm. today. So, Dave, how does that tie in with uh, with Hinduism and yoga? What about the serpent in in Hinduism? Well, the serpent uh, is uh, is the very heart of yoga. I mean the. When you really get into yoga, whether they call it hatha yoga, mm -hmm. physical yoga or not, siddha yoga, uh, ultimately you have to contact the serpent power and release the serpent power. Uh, this is kundalini yoga. Right. The kundalini, kundalini means coiled uh, in the Sanskrit. And this serpent is coiled three and a half times why that was chosen, I don't know, at the base of the spine. And when you reach the proper state of consciousness, which is the goal of yoga, it springs up and manifests itself through the chakras, the four centers, and up through the crown of the head. Uh, and you reach enlightenment. Uh, now, the the books uh, by the yogis, going way back, would say you must have your master there, your guru, mm -hmm. present, because you get involved in this, it could be very dangerous. It could destroy you. And, uh, but this is the goal. They all acknowledge this. And of course, in Hinduism, uh, we've, we've mentioned in the past that Shiva, the the destroyer, he's called, one of the trimurti of the Hindu deities, mm -hmm. uh, he has entwined in his hair serpents. His name is Yogeshwara, which means Lord of Yoga. Uh, and uh, Krishna, you would remember, Tom, back in the days, uh, the Bhagavad Gita was more popular with university students in the Bible, of course. Mm -hmm. The Bhagavad Gita was all about Krishna. Krishna is one of the manifestations of Vishnu, the third in this Trimurti. And uh, I don't think I, I don't believe I even mentioned it in this book, Tom, but I went to India on one occasion to write the story of um, an, in, a Hindu, former Hindu, who had, um, been converted to, to Christ, come to know Christ. And um, it's very interesting how this came about. It involves Vishnu, it involves the Bhagavad Gita, because he was trying to get a guru. You have to have, a, in Hinduism, you have to have a guru. Look, every yoga teacher, not, not the American ones, but the ones Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Muktananda, mm -hmm. uh, Shivananda, and all the rest of them, they were sent by their guru. There is always a guru involved. Uh, and you learn it all from the guru. You study under the guru, and so forth. And um, he was trying to get his grandmother's guru to be his guru. And the man said, you read the Bhagavad Gita for six months. And at the end of that time, I will give you a test to see whether I will be willing to take you on as my chila, my, my disciple. And so he began reading it. Now, his father and his four uncles, they had a place of business. They were moneylenders. It was right on the main square in this village. And so every morning as they were opening up, customers were arriving, he was reading the Bhagavad Gita in the Sanskrit. And uh, he, he came to this verse, I think it's chapter two, somewhere around there. Vishnu is saying, from time to time I come forth in a different form. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the forms was, was Krishna. I come forth to rescue the righteous and to destroy the sinners. Wow. He asked people around him, 
is that, you know, he's reading in the Sanskrit. Do, do I have a misunderstanding of this language? No, they said, that's what it says. He closed that um, Bhagavad Gita, wrapped it in its holy cloth, back on the shelf, that was it. Because he knew he was a sinner, and how is he going to, I mean, Vishnu, in whatever form he comes, is going to destroy him. Tom, amazing how God works. Mm -hmm. One of these despised missionaries, just a few days after that, stands right in front of this man's place of business and opens this little black book. Wow, what do you think he's, the verse he's preaching from, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He never heard that before, of course. Ah, what? That's what I need. <laughs> and he had seen the untouchables. You know, they have their, they're off in a village by themselves. Mm -hmm. That's and, the lowest of the caste. Right. The and uh, he knew, well, they don't even have any caste. And he knew that they, these people read this little black book. He sent one of his servants to get one. And he began to read it, and he met Jesus. His life was transformed. I mean, mm -hmm. but um, here is Krishna, one of the manifestations of Vishnu, and he takes. He is the one who really introduced yoga uh, to mankind. Although uh, Shiva is the, uh, he's the lord of yoga. Uh, Tom, it is so intertwined with Hinduism. Mm -hmm. This is an integral part of the Hindu religion and that it would come to America and then they would say it's purely a science or it's beneficial for health, uh, it has nothing to do with Hinduism. It's just simply a lie. There may be some Western yoga instructors who do not know the truth. But they ought to learn the truth, and mm -hmm. that's why we've written this book. Right. But you'd think, Dave, for those who call themselves Christians, how more obvious can it be that this is so antithetical, so contrary to the Word of God? How, how does this stuff end up in churches? It's just unbelievable. Well, it's a deception, and you quoted earlier that old serpent, I guess that's the title of the chapter, that old serpent, the devil, the rest of the verse says, who deceives the whole world. He is the deceiver, and he is doing a masterful job of deceiving this world with putting the bait out. Oh, you want good health? Uh, you want physical fitness? Okay, get it through yoga. This is the way to do it.